Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Black Mental Health Matters. I'm Dr. Carrie Ann Williams. I'm a psychiatrist practicing here in Massachusetts, and this is a talk show that's about everything related to mental wellness in the Black community and beyond. And today, I wanted to talk about hoarding disorder and OCD. Um, are you a hoarder? <laughs> Uh, is your living space constantly cluttered? Are you anxious about throwing items out because you feel that you might need it in the future? Are you feeling emotionally attached to small items that others might just see as trash? Well, today we're going to talk about what true hoarding disorder is, because a lot of times people refer to themselves as having hoarding tendencies, but hoarding disorder is a real thing. Um, and it affects about 2 to 5% of the U.S. population. Um, it tends to happen more often in people who may be already socially anxious and a bit isolative. Um, and the signs can start as early as in adolescence. Um, but it, it sometimes takes a long time for people to actually get the diagnosis um, of hoarding disorder. And you know, an article from the Journal of Psychiatric Research showed that hoarding increased during the pandemic because you know before people could kind of you know go out and and do other things and be a bit bis distracted but during the pandemic people were spending a lot more time at home and just kind of ordering a lot of things online um, so they would just order them and accumulate them now you know along that thread people who hoard items also have a tendency to compulsively buy items OK, so in the same way that they may be holding on to items just in case something um, happens or just in case they need it in the future, they may also be buying items for the same reason. They might be using it in the future. And so during the pandemic, the threat of scarcity of certain items influenced individuals who already had this kind of tendency or this problem with hoarding to lean in even more to compulsively buying items and accumulating it. Now, it's not clear why some people hoard and others don't, um, but many people who uh, have hoarding disorder also have a close family member who is also a hoarder. And um, sometimes people start hoarding after a major event in their life, you know, maybe they've lost someone who's close to them. Um, and then they become anxious about losing things, losing items, losing memories. And so they just start holding on to everything. Um, and sometimes it can start late in life. Um, sometimes it can start after a person begins to suffer from dementia. They can actually even start, you know, hoarding things and have difficulty throwing things away. Um, so in any case, who among us are the true hoarders, okay? Because as I said before, many people use the word hoarding in a very general way. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what a psychiatrist would consider a hoarding disorder. So first, uh, one of the things we look for is a person who, as I mentioned earlier, can they, they tend to purchase items compulsively. They purchase a large number of items um, and they really have a difficult time throwing them away. So they purchase them, they accumulate them, they collect them, they don't throw them away. And in many cases, the things that are the possessions, that the things that they're accumulating are items that most people would consider to be useless or of little value. These are, they're not necessarily collecting valuable items. They're collecting things that other people might walk around and they might see those items as you know, potentially uh, trash, really. Um, and so if you've ever seen portrayals on TV of hoarders, you know, there's like a TV show about it. Um, you'll notice that when you look around the homes of the individuals that they go to and you see some of the items that are stacked up, you'll think, why are they collecting that? Um, that is one of the signs of a true hoarder is that they're gathering items that other people would consider to be of little value. Um, so they have no practical use, but if you try to discard it, they may get really anxious about it, or they might even get angry about you trying to discard their items. Um, so the hoarding of these items then leads to a very, very cluttered space. And it's not just a matter of clutter. It is that it's to the point where the, um, the number of items prevents the person from really using the space. 
and uh, it affects their day-to-day -day functioning in a significant way. Um, and it causes them significant distress. So this is not a, a thing where the person is accumulating items and they you know, enjoy it. They, they don't really necessarily get joy out of the items that they're accumulating. You know, this is different from, you know, people who are collectors. You know, sometimes people collect items and they get a lot of joy out of collecting items and they, you know, present their collection on a, a special um, bookcase or there might be a special room where they have these items they've collected and they get a lot of joy out of it. That's not what this is. This is not a special collector that enjoys something. This is um, a disorder. People tend to feel very distressed. Um, in fact, it's something that kind of makes a person feel kind of trapped or locked in um, because they don't um, feel free um, to be able to let things go. Now, people who have hoarding disorder may not necessarily consider themselves to be hoarders. And this is part of why, even though the signs may start in adolescence, it may take a long time for people to really come to the attention of a provider or um, to be treated. They often feel it's just wise for them to hold on to all of these items just in case something happens. Um, and they, they just kind of never really feel ready to part with the possessions that they own. Um, often people that have hoarding disorder, they'll also have problems with disorganization. So what happens is that they have this problem with this uh, trouble with problem solving. So they don't really know what to do with items when they get them. So what happens is that when they have an item, they're not sure what to do with it. They can't organize it. They don't want to throw it away. So they just kind of store it. Um, so very commonly, psychiatrists will find that people that have hoarding disorder, they also have some difficulty with organization and problem solving, how to kind of categorize, store, and discard items in their home. Sometimes what happens too is that they feel this need that they have to be able to see everything. So even the idea of, oh, let's move some of these things to a storage facility or some, something like that, there's often resistance too because the person feels like they need to be able to see all the items. Um, it's, a, a, it's part of the fear of losing those items. And it's also part of the disorganization and that sense of not wanting to, to feel that loss you need to be able to kind of visualize where your things are. So then they end up being surrounded by stacks and stacks of these items. But you might be wondering, what's the big deal, right? What's the big deal if somebody wants to collect stacks and stacks of things? You know, if they wanna live in a crowded and cluttered home, why don't you just let them do it? Well, as I said before, this is not just clutter. It's not just clutter the massive number of items in their home becomes hazardous. It really does become hazardous. So stacks of items can topple and can crush people. It can crush and trap children. So sometimes when people have severe hoarding disorder, they may be even at risk of not being able to have physical custody of their children because of the hazardous nature of their home. Um, it's also a fire hazard right? When you have a cluttered home like that, it's a fire hazard. And these stacks of items can block off exits. If there's a crisis, you may not even be able to exit your home um, you know, very quickly. Again, you may bump into things and they may topple. Um, you can also end up with health issues from mold, dust. You can end up with a pest, infesta a pest infestation if things are there for a very long time. Um, so you kind of create a health hazard for yourself with all of the items that are in your home. Um, and, you know, sometimes people um, with a hoarding disorder, they um, store even um, items outside on their lawn. And that can be a problem for the neighborhood. Um, it can create a hazard for neighbors. If you rent your space, you may be in danger of eviction. So this is a scenario that is, is quite common. If somebody's a hoarder and they're in a rented space, they often will be in danger of losing their home. Um, and, you know, hoarding is, is associated with a higher level overall of disability. Um, it tends to coexist with other conditions like depression and um, and people who have hoarding um, problems also have problems socially with their family and um, with their marriages and things like that. You know, people come in and they think you can't continue to live like this. It's it's um it's a really disabling condition. So you know the big question is, can people recover? 
can people recover from hoarding? I mean, you know, you see, again, you watch these TV shows and the people kind of come in and they're like, we're going to blast all this clutter out of here and they're going to clean up the home. And, you know, that's great from a cosmetic perspective to kind of clean the place up. But hoarding disorder is a psychological condition. So you do need to address what's underlying the, the, the tendency to hoard, right? And um, to be fair, the prognosis for hoarders is not necessarily a very bright prognosis. Um, the people who have hoarding disorder, they often continue to struggle with the tendency to hoard items. So it's something that is really difficult to overcome. Um, so if, even if somebody comes in and they do a, a massive kind of cleaning out project, the tendency to have difficulty throwing items away, that tendency is still there. So they may still have a, a compulsive need to buy. They may still have a compulsive um, issue with kind of holding on to things that they might um, need just in case and just have difficulty throwing things away. Now, a few patients do respond to medication. Um, and some patients also respond to traditional psychotherapies like cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. And then there are some people that have found a particular type of therapy helpful, which includes things like training in decision making and categorization. Because remember, I said that people who hoard often have difficulty with decision making um, and with organizing and kind of where to put things and how to store things. So having um, training in decision making and categorization can be a part of the therapy. Also, the therapy will include some amount of what we would call maybe desensitization to the feeling of throwing things away because there's an anxiety, a fear, and an attachment to items. So they have a fear of throwing them away. So part of the therapy can include desensitizing them to how it feels to throw things away. Um, so it's a type of exposure therapy, really, to the emotions of throwing things out um, so that theoretically it can become less difficult over time. Um, and the other thing that's done, and this is a kind of a part of cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, is something that we call cognitive restructuring. And that is basically reframing the way you think or shifting the way you think. Uh, and so all the folks, all, all the thoughts that folks might have uh, what that kind of rationalize their hoarding behaviors, you know, like you know, I might need this or whatnot, all those thoughts that rationalize the behaviors, the therapist can guide them through a process of teaching them to challenge those thoughts and rethink and kind of gain perspective. So again, it's not just that the therapist is challenging those thoughts. They're training the person with the hoarding disorder to learn how to challenge their own thoughts and overcome them and reframe them and gain a new perspective. So this launches me to talking into talking about obsessive compulsive disorder in general, because hoarding disorder is a type of obsessive compulsive disorder. It is not OCD. It's, it's its own thing. Hoarding disorder is its own thing, but it's in this general family of obsessive compulsive types of disorders. But now I'm going to talk about OCD. Um, a 2016 article from uh, the OCD newsletter um, kind of showed that most research on OCD did not really include racially diverse sample populations. So there's still, I think, a lot of research to be done on OCD in the Black population and African Americans. Um, now, some data has shown that African Americans suffer from OCD at the same rates as everyone else, but they were less likely to receive treatment. Now, one barrier to kind of the research, because again, it's, there's not a lot of research that's racially diverse, but one barrier to the research is the history of research-based abuses of African-Americans historically in the U.S. So this continues to contribute to a reluctance to sign up for research studies. So it can be more challenging to recruit a diverse study, and the industry really needs to work on how to address that. Um, the other kind of barrier that they found in um, this particular study, and this is a study called African Americans with Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, an update. It was in the current psychiatry reviews. Um, and in that study, they found that lower income participants that went to community clinics often found that the, uh, the diagnosis of an anxiety disorder 
that was very low on the priority list. So when low income folks went to community clinics to be diagnosed with, um, you know, health conditions, people kind of, there's so many other things that people paid attention to that diagnosing an anxiety disorder or diagnosing OCD was really low on the priority list. So they often didn't even get diagnosed. Um, and then even if the symptoms were recognized and people suspected or diagnosed it, there was often not a um, provider available in these community clinics that were sufficiently trained in how to treat OCD because the treatment of OCD is a specialty treatment. So what happens is that African-Americans who suffer from OCD, they may be underdiagnosed, they have no idea where to go to get help, and they sometimes also fear being treated diff differently, um, which is a valid fear. Um, and, um, you know, again, the research kind of shows that African-Americans with severe anxiety and compulsions, again, are more likely to be thought of as psychotic rather than as having a severe anxiety disorder. Same kind of thing. Remember, I spoke with you um, on a different week about bipolar disorder um, and how a lot of times African-Americans who present with bipolar disorder, they may have some psychotic features, but they, they often end up with a diagnosis of schizophrenia rather than bipolar disorder. It's kind of a similar process that can happen with people that have severe anxiety or severe OCD. They end up being diagnosed as being primarily psychotic rather than primarily anxious. And the problem is that there's a different treatment path for people who have OCD versus people who have psychotic disorders. So if you are misdiagnosed, you don't get the treatment that you need. You don't get the right treatment. And so you may not um, have the, the prognosis that you would hope for, okay? Um, then in terms of how uh, African-Americans with OCD tend to present, um, you know, a lot of us kind of think, um, we're looking for kind of classic symptoms of OCD, like oh, excessive hand washing or kind of compulsive checking of things. And, and certainly African-Americans who have OCD, they do report the same kinds of symptoms as other people. They do have a lot of the same fears. There was a, a, the same study um, that a uh, so study called Symptom Dimensions in two samples of African-Americans with obsessive compulsive disorder it showed that African Americans with OCD reported more fears of contamination, so like germ fears. But the, this study also found that African Americans were twice as likely to report concerns with animals, um, which I thought was interesting. And it reminded me actually of a YouTube video that I saw with Kevin Hart on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. And it was one of those... Um, episodes where Jimmy Fallon had one of these animal experts come on the show from Australia, bringing all kinds of strange animals. And Kevin Hart flipped out. Um, and that video went really viral. And it actually generated a lot of attention for the charity that the, um, the animal expert was representing. But Kevin Hart appeared to have a very genuine aversion and fear to a lot of these animals. And um, according to this study, African Americans with with um with OCD tend to be twice as likely to report concerns with animals. I'm not saying that Kevin Hart has OCD. I'm just saying that the the concern with animals reminded me of that video. So you should guys should go check it out. But um, in any case, um, in addition to how uh, African Americans present with OCD, it's also important to know, uh, you know, what else can go along with OCD. People with OCD, of course, would have a risk of depression and things like that. Um, there's a study in the Journal of Black Psychology called Psychiatric Comorbidity and Hoarding Symptoms in African Americans with Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. And this one recommended that African American women with OCD should also be assessed for PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. So it seems as though Black women who have trauma um, sometimes can also have obsessive compulsive disorder. The study recommended that African-American men with OCD should be assessed for alcohol use disorder. So there's a, a correlation between using, you know, becoming, um, uh, being alcoholic and also having OCD. So that's what the study kind of recommended. Both men and women should be assessed for depression. 
All right, so let me just pause for a second and explain how do you even know if you have OCD? Because it's a term that we throw around a lot. A lot of times people say, oh, I'm so OCD. I do this and I that and I do, I'm just so OCD um, because I like to have things a certain way. But the true diagnosis of OCD is not just, um, you know, having an issue that's inconvenient. It's, it's disabling. It's really a disabling. So there are the obsessions and those are the thoughts. And then there's the compulsions and those are the actions. Um, because the actions are more visible, they tend to be the thing that others notice the most. But the thoughts tend to fuel the actions, okay? So thoughts, for example, about contamination and germs can lead to excessive hand washing. Or if somebody has a thought, well, what if the back door isn't locked? They might check that door several times to make sure it's locked. Um, and then very commonly, there's like a feeling of dread that if you have the thought and you don't do the action, there's this feeling of dread that something bad is going to happen. And sometimes it's something indefinable. That's just something bad is going to happen. Sometimes it's something specific, you know, um, but there's a feeling of fear and dread that comes along with it. Um, and a lot of times people that have OCD, they know that the fear is not completely justified. They know that some part of this is not completely rational, that they don't need to check something so many times or that they don't need to wash their hands that many times. Um, and so they tend to try to resist to do it. And that's part of how we make the diagnosis as well is that there's this, this um, thought and there's this compulsion, but there's also an attempt to resist the compulsion as well. But it's difficult to resist that urge. And um, it's they when they kind of have the action or the compulsion, it has this, it serves to kind of neutralize the fear. Um, so whether they feel like if they count um, a certain number of uh, times or they count in a certain way, they're going to prevent something bad from happening. So it neutralizes what they fear or they're repeating words silently that neutralizes the fear, it kind of calms them down. Um, sometimes there's a need for symmetry. You know, people need to have things being even um, in order to kind of feel like it's just right. Um, and sometimes there's just kind of a feeling, they call it like the, the just right feeling. It's indefinable, but they kind of seek after things feeling just right. And again, it's the kind of thing that can just trap you and lock you in because how do you know when things are just right? So it can be um, very disabling in that way. Um, so one also kind of another possible feature of OCD that some people have, and they don't really talk very much about it, is intrusive thoughts, intrusive thoughts. So people with OCD can have intrusive, obsessive thoughts. And the intrusive thought is often something very disturbing to the person, which is part of the reason why they maybe don't really talk about it all that much. It can be something really disturbing. So sometimes the intrusive thought is something sexual. Sometimes it's something aggressive, like maybe an intrusive thought of hurting somebody or they kind of see someone being hurt. And it's just so disturbing to them. They don't really want to tell anybody that they're having it. They don't want anybody to think poorly of them. So they often will keep some of these intrusive thoughts to themselves, but it's really um, stressful. Um, and so people with OCD can keep their, their, keep their symptoms a secret for a long time before they finally come for treatment. Um, now, many people develop OCD after a stressful event. Sometimes that's how it starts. It's very, very biological, though. So some people will just kind of struggle with symptoms of OCD throughout their life. Um, and it just it's not really tied back to any kind of stressful event necessarily. Um, and in terms of treatment, maybe a third to a half of them tend to have a good or fair response to treatment. And then the other half may have more chronic issues particularly if symptoms start in childhood, the illness can be more severe overall. Um, people with OCD, as I said earlier, they're kind of prone to depression as well. Um, and they're also at higher risk for suicidal thoughts. Because again, imagine feeling so locked in by these symptoms, you may begin to feel depressed, hopeless, um, and have uh, you know thoughts of suicide. So you know, if that's something that you're struggling with, you should definitely, again, 
contact your PCP, set up an appointment to get a referral to a psychiatrist, um, or if you're you know imminently thinking of hurting yourself, you know call a suicide hotline. That's something you can easily just Google the, the hotline in your area. Now, sometimes people with OCD actually resist therapy and they refuse treatment with medications. So that can make it complicated as well. Um, if they don't want to be treated, um, they continue to kind of struggle. Medications can be quite helpful for OCD and they should be um, at least trialed for um, a period of time to see if that could be helpful. Most commonly, um, a group of medications called SSRIs or serotonin, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, there are things like Prozac, Zoloft, Luvox are, are commonly prescribed for OCD. Um, and the therapy that's recommended is cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, but it includes a component called exposure and response prevention. Um, and it's important, this, this component, exposure with response prevention, this requires specialized training. Um, and this is it's included because usually when people have anxiety problems, they would just do regular exposure therapy. So if, like if you have a fear of um, dogs, you know, they'll just kind of slowly expose you to dogs until you're desensitized and you feel comfortable around dogs. That's exposure therapy. But with OCD, the issue is that the person does a compulsive behavior to kind of neutralize the anxiety. So if you fear that the back door is, um, is, is open, you'll just keep checking and checking and checking. Or, you know, what sometimes people do is they kind of um, come up with like a ritual where maybe they tap the desk five times or they they count in their mind. And that ritual or that um, repetition kind of neutralizes whatever it is that they fear is going to happen. Again, as I'm saying this, you're probably thinking that doesn't really make sense. Again, the person with OCD recognizes that to some degree, this doesn't seem to be completely kind of rational, but again, they're locked into this disorder. So what happens when we do the therapy is that if you do the exposure and the person just does some kind of ritual to, to neutralize their anxiety, then the, the treatment is not enough. You have to do an exposure and then work on doing the response prevention. So we're going to use the example of hand washing. Somebody's afraid of germs. Um, you have to expose them to some, uh, some kind of surface that maybe is not necessarily clean and work with them to prevent the response of excessive hand washing. So this is actually a very tricky thing to do and it does require a specialist. And unfortunately for many African-Americans that have OCD, they don't have access to these specialists that know how to do CBT with exposure and response prevention. So it's another way that there may be um, a disparity in access to services. Um, so African-Americans are not being recognized, they're not receiving the treatment, um, and there's no evidence that they experience OCD at lower rates than the rest of the population, um, and OCD can be very disabling. Um, people with OCD, I, I want to just kind of talk a little bit about the idea of rituals, because I, I think I kind of skipped over that a little bit quickly. People with OCD can have rituals. And this is one of the many things that can be very disabling for a person. So I'm going to explain to you what a ritual is. A ritual may be quite elaborate sometimes, but it may be something like I've, I have to tap the refrigerator 12 times, then I have to touch the faucet exactly seven times, then I have to tap the trash can with my foot, then I have to turn the light switch on, on and off 10 times, before I can leave the house every day. And that's an example of a very short ritual, you know, tapping the refrigerator, then tapping the, the faucet, then touching the trash can, then flipping the light switch on and off before leaving the house. That's really short. Some people have longer, more elaborate rituals where they have to tap things and touch things and turn things and kick things. And if they don't do the ritual, they can't move on. So imagine if you're running late, but you can't leave the house until you've done a 20 minute ritual of things that you have to do. And if you don't do it, you literally can't move forward. Um, the other thing is that um, 
if the ritual is disrupted, sometimes people can become very distressed and very emotional. So if they can't do the ritual in the exact way that they want to do it, they can really like have an emotional breakdown, end up crying and not be able to move forward with their day. The other thing is sometimes if you're, you know, you exist in a family, other people in the household, they can disrupt your ritual sometimes, but sometimes they can get um, involved in the ritual. So a person with OCD may ask you to be a part of their ritual in some way. Can you tap this thing? Can you touch that thing? Um, and so then all of a sudden you're a part of their ritual. Um, the other part of it is um, sometimes you have to accommodate their fear, right? So if that person has a contamination fear, they're, they're really fearful of germs, then everybody else in the house gets stuck with all the dirty jobs. They are the ones cleaning the dishes and everything because the person with OCD is too fearful to touch the dirty dishes. So it can create a lot of problems socially within families. Um, and for the person, it's just very disabling because it prevents them from functioning in life. Um, and uh, imagine if you are, you know, somebody who has a, a compulsion, um, an obsession about symmetry, right? And they're getting ready for an event. And then they look in the mirror and they look at their sleeves and they think, oh, my sleeves don't look even. So they're trying to even their sleeves out to get it symmetrical. But every time they look in the mirror, they still feel like their sleeves are still not even. They can be there for such a long time trying to even their sleeves out and become increasingly distressed and tearful and upset because they just can't get their sleeves to even out. So they miss the event they're trying to go to and they end up in emotional distress and tears. So this is a very um, disabling condition and it's not as casual as just saying, oh, I'm so OCD about this, that or the other. Obsessive compulsive disorder is um, a very serious issue um, and as I mentioned, medication is a really important thing to try. Um, you know, up to half of people find medications to be really helpful. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy, especially with exposure response prevention from a qualified practitioner can be extremely helpful. Um, and of course, doing both the medications and the therapy is the recommended treatment for OCD. Um, and regardless of, of the situation, you should, even if, even if you're not, your response to medications is not that great, you should continue on with meeting with a provider because there are other things that I'm not talking about today because I'm not going to get into too much detail. But when people don't respond to medications and therapy, there are other options as well that your provider can discuss with you. So as I kind of wrap up, because today is not gonna, I don't want this to go too long. Um, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about something that people sometimes tend to think of as OCD, but it's not OCD. It's something called obsessive compulsive personality disorder. It's a type of personality. It's an obsessive compulsive personality. Um, so people who have an obsessive compulsive personality they don't necessarily have OCD, okay? And here's kind of how a person might know if they have an obsessive compulsive personality. And again, I'm oversimplifying it, but kind of looking through the criteria, um, people who have obsessive compulsive personality, they tend to focus on things being in order and they may be quite rigid and very constricted and serious in their personality. They're often inflexible and they're preoccupied with details and with following the rules and following the schedule. But it is to the extent that they lose sight of the big picture. They're so focused on the details and the rules that they lose sight of the big picture. I guess what they call seeing the forest from the trees, as they say. Um, and they can have a perfectionism. And that perfectionism can interfere with their ability to actually finish what needs to be done because they're trying so hard to make it all so right that again, they lose sight of the big picture, but they also can't even finish the task that is at hand. Um, and they may be reluctant to delegate tasks to people unless the person they're delegating it to can do it exactly the way they want it done. Um, some of you might have some coworkers that are like this. Um, and 
sometimes they're very inflexible even on issues of like um, ethics and morality. And they can also be devoted to work to an extent that they kind of have no social life. They can be very indecisive and they ruminate on decision making. Um, now, you may be hearing some of these things and thinking, oh, I know someone that's like that, or I kind of have some of these features. But in order to kind of meet criteria for an obsessive compulsive personality disorder, you have to kind of meet multiple things. And it has to be in some way kind of really affect your life negatively in some way. Um, so, you know, it's something you can always look up more later on. Um, uh, do kind of do some more research, but I wanted to just talk about obsessive compulsive personality disorder because I think sometimes we come across people who have that kind of personality disorder um, and it's different from OCD. It's not the same thing. The treatment for um, obsessive compulsive personality is primarily psychotherapy um, and that, that can be helpful, um, but it's not really a medication that treats personality. Um, but medications can treat things like anxiety and depression that can come along with having an obsessive compulsive personality. So again, medication and therapy, kind of the thing to think about. Um, as you can imagine, people that have an obsessive compulsive personality may not even come to uh, see a treatment provider for it because they may not recognize it as an issue. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it is a condition and it's different from OCD. So that's it for today from me. Um, let me know what your thoughts are about OCD, about hoarding and obsessive compulsive personality. Um, thanks for joining me this week for Black Mental Health Matters. And I will talk with you next time. So take care. <laughs>